All right, welcome back, guys, to another edition of our Pro 1600 podcast. Today, we are going to talk about the Baja 1000. This year's the 2023 Baja 1000, starting in La Paz and finishing in Ensenada. Uh, with me, as always, is our host, Brian Johnson. Brian, what we got going on today? Good afternoon, race fans. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, so we uh, we decided to do a little uh, Baja 1000 preview show. We've got a couple couple different uh, teammates here. We have uh, Victor Bereda. Uh, and Reese Pedersen with, um, they, I know they're teaming up and Rob McCachron's old Alumacraft single seater. Uh, and then we have uh, Eric Pavolka, current score 1600 points leader. Yeah, there we go, Eric. Congratulations. Yes, having a good year so far. And uh, Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, you you have a, a Fodril chassis, is that correct? Uh, yeah, that's correct. Right on, right on. I like that car. I've always, I've always liked that car. Yeah, thanks. It's awesome. We actually got uh, another one in the works. There you so go. That's, that's good to hear. Nice. Nice. So, yeah. So, guys, real quick, a brief uh, kind of intro to this year's Baja 1000. To my knowledge, this is the second longest Baja 1000 to date, only superseded by the Baja 2000, which I was 10 years old at the time and unfortunately <laughs> only saw on uh, VHS tapes to date myself a little bit. So, um, uh, Eric... You you've ran every score race this year. Um, what what sets this race aside from the others? I mean, what, what you you've done you've done now obviously over a thousand miles in Baja already this year. What what makes this one different? Uh, I think it's uh, the size of the team that we put together. So um, you know, the smaller the race, the more focused you are. I mean, as racers, that's what we do is we focus in on our car, our driving. Like, don't touch my stuff. I got it exactly like I like it. Um, so to get to the next level, to get more miles, um, you have to let go of some of that control. So uh, that's been, you know, working up through that throughout the year is like allowing other people to have control of their section of the race, you know, their everything for that matter, because I have no control of what happens for the first thousand miles. I'm sitting there waiting. So yeah, so I guess that actually begs the question: who who are you bringing on on board to uh, team up with you on this one? Or unless it's a unless it's a trade secret, <laughs> it's all top secret. But oh, it's the usual: Andy uh, Dave Roselli. He's going to start off, and um, he's doing most of the managing of the race this year. So he's picked the team, he's picked the mileage, he's picked the you know everything, and then. I've just kind of taken a step back, focused on prepping the car, prepping myself, and and uh, my section will be the last section. Um, uh, yeah, so so really, it's all it's all it's all Andy. It's the Andy show. It's so the, Andy, the, Andy's your kind of your logistical coordinator, as it were. Yeah, kind of everything coordinator. That's good. Years. I mean, I I could pick worse guys to have as the logistical yeah. kind of head honcho. I mean, he's he's got a few miles under his belt. Down there south of the border, he's one with some of the best. So probably a great guy to have on your team. Yeah. Yeah. And his dad, for that matter. So sure. it just it and, goes and, back. And I guess his engines are, you know, okay. If you have to really, <laughs> it's pretty you good. Have to really talk about them. It's pretty now, good. Uh, so you said you're getting in at mile, you said a thousand. So you're, that's well, really. Well, hard. actually, and I, I just said that, but. And honestly, I don't know what mile I'm getting in until I get closer to get down there. So sure. uh, I'm totally unprepared as far as like what mile is this and what is that. And so I'm basically the last section. So it's anywhere from three to 400 miles, whatever yeah. he tells me. So once I get down there um, at the end of this, uh, like this weekend, then uh, obviously that's time to focus. I'll know how to find the spot exactly where I'm getting in. You know, I'll feel how that area is. So I'll run the whole sure. course uh, pre-running. Then once I get that, uh, you know, it's like getting the perspective of how long it is. I like to do that first. Then I can I can feel like, oh, maybe I should slow down a little bit or I need to speed up one of the two. Sure. And then I'll go back again and then fine tune whatever it is. If it's whatever I'm paranoid about of getting, say, stuck or not getting a good line or something, then we'll go back and hit those. So it's kind of how I do my pre-running. No, that's good. So let's jump over to Victor. Victor, you're obviously coming to us live from the front seat of, I'm assuming, your truck after a long day of pre-running. Sorry for the bouncy camera. I apologize for that. I get no, you're busy. fine. You're fine. So uh, you're actually live in Baja right now just after a day of pre-running. Why don't you tell us uh, 
what you did today and, and how the course was. So today we did the second loop from uh, mile 225 to uh, mile 300, which is uh, Loreto. Yeah. And uh, yeah, pretty much uneventful. It's a pretty, pretty fast section uh, with a good, um, good amount of mileage from San Javier down to the, to the, uh, to the wash that's uh, all paved and speed zone. So yeah, it's, it's a fast section, but it's still fun. Some really nice places to see up there in the mountains for sure. A lot of water crossings in that section, no? Uh, usually they are, but this has been a very dry season. So there's just a couple of them. They're not, they're not very deep. So I think that's interesting. That's gonna... I thought, I thought the recent hurricane might've just let the floodgates loose and we would have been, I told, I told my guy who's driving that section to bring his flippers. <laughs> yeah, you know, luckily it didn't rain that much up here. So it was right mostly on. La Paz to Cabo where, where it really got dumped. So yeah, there's, now, there's much rain damage at all. Even starting La Paz, um, it's actually non-existent. That that's good to hear, and I think that's actually going to surprise a lot of people. I mean, just judging of the videos that Score put out a couple weeks ago, I think a lot of people were expecting it to be completely chewed apart and big giant washouts. And I'm sure those are out there somewhere, but it's good to hear that it's not as horrible as our imagination might let us think it is. Yeah, no, not at all. We did that that section uh, yesterday, and uh, there no, we didn't see any. There's just one section that had mud. Um, I think that was mile one twenty. But that was just because it rained that morning or that evening. I don't, I don't think that's going to be in the race, though. Right on. Now, Victor, you guys are you're splitting the race in a single seater, which I'll come to that in a minute. That that in and of itself is is quite the the heavy lift. But um, how many drivers are you, are you having, and and what section are you running? If you can divulge that information, if you don't feel like sharing, that's okay too. No, no, that's fine. So uh, we're a total of three drivers, and I'm doing the uh, first section. And uh, a friend of mine, Juan Cota, which is also a, a local Cabo San Lucas racer, is doing um, the middle section from Loreto to uh, Vizcaino. And then uh, I'll jump in again there and, and rent it up to uh, to Reese around Bay of LA. Right on. Yeah, that's that's that sounds like a pretty good strategy. For a lot of the teams I've talked to, four to six drivers is kind of what everyone's looking at. We're actually... On the heavier side in, in 1669, I'm, I'm racing with Mark Winston, and we kind of opted if, you know, for us, it's like, you know, we're going to try to keep everybody really fresh because sure. it's just over 1,300 miles. We just don't know what's going to happen, and there's a good chance somebody's going to have to get back in the car that wasn't supposed to be back in there in the, in the first place. So That's, we decided yeah. let's keep the stints nice and short. Let's keep our guys really fresh. Hopefully, we can keep pace with you guys and – you know, oh, sure. just trying to have kind of a good showing. And, and the good thing is, too, is, you know, a 1,300-mile race is a little different than, like, the last race uh, Pro 1600 and I covered where it's 110% from the green flag drop to the checkered flag. I think this, obviously, I don't think anybody's planning on running 100% at the green flag. I think you'd have to be pretty <laughs> foolish. To... I will. This guy yeah, there you go. <laughs> Uh, the funny thing you have, uh, you have the three, the three pole positions for the thousand in your show. So he's starting behind, behind us, right? Yep. And then um, we're second, and I think Eric, you're you're first, right? Yep. Yeah. So All right. right. Here. One, two, and three, and we're starting eight. So well, I'm actually. Really... <laughs> I love that. I love that. Now, uh, Reese, let's jump over to you. You obviously, this is your old car. You sold it to Victor. It's cool to see you guys teamed up for this one. Um, mm -hmm. I know in the pre-show you mentioned you ran some code and some record, but this is your first thousand in the driver's seat, correct? Yeah, and you know what's interesting is anytime we go down to Mexico, whether it be for um, you know just a fun weekend or trip, we always go to San Felipe, and so it's it's like the one section that I feel like I know because we've just put in hundreds of miles down there and had fun, and usually it's just with the boys and the pre-runners going around. And so a lot of the section that we're going through, essentially I'm going to be getting in, as Victor said, um, I'm going to be doing the Catavina loop and then jump back on the highway, run the highway up um, and go through San Felipe and yeah. then essentially jump out right when I drop into Valley T. And I've seen that desert. And so I'm really excited because we're going somewhere that I feel like I know, and I'm going to have enough time uh, with Eric Dean, who's going to be spending uh 
quite some time the next, you know, coming up days in the car behind me getting some miles in. So it's you a guys long are gonna be get, You guys are going to be getting real friendly, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a long section. You know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm taking on a lot of miles. Uh, it's going to be, I think, some rough, some rough desert. We're going to see some whooped out areas. We're going to see some silt beds. You know, I, I'm the way I'm looking at it is the races that, that we know really well, Brian, um, the more races, um, we do 250, 300 miles there all the time and, and it's wide open. Um, it's, you know, if you lift, you lose this kind of the mentality and we do that all the time. And so if you look at my section, you take out the 95 high mile highway miles. Um, I'm right back to the mileage that I'm used to and it's not the same pace. You know, the goal is going to be to keep the car together. One of the things that um, Eric Pavolka has a big advantage on us is the 2D. Um, we're running an 091, and so you need to keep the the gearbox together. And yeah. so when you're down in more and you're racing those rough races in Barstow, you're skipping over everything. You're wide open all the time. Um, you know, down here in Baja, we're going to really be focused on keeping that gearbox together, shifting smooth, rolling through some of the stuff that we'd usually be plowing through. Yep. Yeah, and I, I really think that's a great point is, is, Eric, you do have a big advantage with that transmission. I mean, there's there's no two ways about it. Um, I think a majority of the class, if I'm not mistaken, is running in 091. Um, and I think all of us are nervous. <laughs> I don't know about the rest of you guys, but a, a thousand miles on a, on a, on a transmission is about as far as I like to take it before I get it reprepped. So that extra three and, and then to boot the last, you know, third of that course is San Felipe, which I'm sure, you know, you guys all heard in the Fishistic show is, hey, good job. You just finished the thousand. Now go run, run up Zoo Road. Yeah. yeah. So. If yeah. we're all, everyone's kind of like, you know, all right, everyone's take it easy. Let's just get this thing across the finish line and, and see what we can do. I mean, I think if there is any racing to be done, it, it might start around the Valley T area. You know, if you're, yeah. if we're, if you're close to somebody in that, in that stretch, then that might be the time to, Hey, do we want to try to push and make a move? But before that, I, man, I think honestly, if you can just avoid from getting stuck, avoid bottlenecks and avoid, you know, any silly mechanicals, you got a really good shot at winning this thing. Yeah, we've got 19 cars entered, uh, and I I think it's going to be an attrition race. Is if, if you're smart, you don't get flats. You keep the car together, and you stick to your game plan. Um, you're going to have a really good day. Um, you know, even if you just run 75, 60 percent pace, you're probably going to put it on the podium if you do that. Yep. It, it's it's interesting to see that. I think you know, Eric. I definitely think you're the the Baja veteran of the group. I think you've definitely got the most miles, at least in the last four or five seasons with score, but how easy is it to stick to that plan of, Hey, let's just run 60, 70%. And <laughs> at the end of the day, we take the cards that are dealt to us. <laughs> I, I say it every time. And then I just hammer down right off the line. I do it but every time. And my nephew always rides with me and he, you know, he's yelling at me, calm down, save the car. I think we all do it. Um, you know, then, you know, after getting 100 miles in, it's like, all right. And so what I try to focus on is not necessarily, it's not really the speed, but the mistakes. Like if I feel I'm blowing a corner, like off into a tree, well, then that tells me that it's not necessarily the speed, but, you know, the mistake. So I think if we Absolutely. go as fast as we can without mistakes, and then we're good. Yeah. And I, and I think Reese made a really good point is, you know, running 60, 70% of what we consider race pace here in the States, probably going to land you on the podium, hmm. which is, which is pretty wild. I mean, you know, I mean, did anybody here race the Baja 2000? Oh, okay, there we go. So <laughs> what, what did you race? Truck. Trophy truck. Okay. We finished. And how was that? It was miserable. I, I, it, it took 10 years probably just to realize that it was great. But it was it was horrible. We had issues, and it was and it you know it took days, and it it was torturous, and uh, <laughs> you know it was it was an accomplishment. I mean, you know, years later, like wow, I'm glad we did that. And, you know, I'm glad we pushed. It was, I think, it was almost 80 hours for us to finish. We had a head gasket, and uh, you know, we just took turns, uh, you know, babying it through, and adding water. It was with the Greer Brothers Racing. And, uh, but we did it, you know, we got, we got the finish. I remember I was in the last section and we stopped for a pit hundred miles away from the finish and I got out and, and, uh, my co-driver was Eric Jones was falling asleep 
in the truck while we were racing. I got on, I saw a tailgate, I fell on it, and then Glenn Greer woke me up, said, hey, it's ready, you getting back in, you want me to take it? I said, go ahead and take it to the finish. <laughs> I, I didn't even do the last 100 miles, it was too much. I mean, it was just, you know, delirium was, was Mac, it was there. It was you know, it's, fun, it, it's funny, you talk about that, and that kind of lends to my point of us having six drivers on our team of like, you know, we, we've, so we did the, we did the thousand in 2017 in, in five sixteen hundred. We got second. We had a relatively uneventful day. Um, all things considered, um, you know, we got stuck a few times, nothing major, no major mechanicals where we had to send parts in or, or we, you know, we got unstuck on our own on course. And then we all kind of look back at each other and we're like, I don't think any of us realize how lucky we just got on our first crack at the thousand to go do the peninsula run. And we had like really no issues. I think we changed an alternator out of, out of like caution at one of the pits in Loretto. And then like we went down in 2018, we lost a transmission at mile 60, swapped it out, broke a, a, a spindle at mile hundred, swapped it out, lost a second trans 12 miles from the leader at mile 700. Okay. swapped it out yeah i see victor's face there Thousands. um yeah so i mean and then that was kind of like the holy shit like this sucks mm -hmm. this really sucks i don't and it's like you we don't know if we want to go back like everybody gets back to the to the hotel and you're just like guys like i don't know i think golf might be for us like you know let's go drink <laughs> some beers and, and eat the golf cart you know okay. like this was it's like a hangover. You're like, I'm never going to drink again. And then <laughs> yeah. next weekend you're, you're back on the beers. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Some, somebody brings it up at, at the bonfire the next weekend. Like, Hey, you guys want to do it again yeah. next year? And you're like, Hmm, I think I do. Cause I hate myself. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that so, was yeah. like us at the uh, 06, our, my first peninsula run. I mean, all the way down, we were leading all the way to like 600, 700 mile marker. And, and then, uh, Transmission was separating from the engine, had a blown CV boot. And I mean, it was just the Baja started winning, but we still finished. We got a second, an hour out of first, and it was just just enough, just a taste to uh to always want to just bring it back, you know. But it's 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 just the love of that sport, I guess. It, it, it really is. It, it embodies, you know, it, it, just said his, his state of off-road the other week a couple of weeks ago and he asked me as, as a limited guy what, what attracts you to a lot of different series i said you know honestly like moore's car count and the competition is great but there's that allure of mexico the adventure of it you know 19 cars in class is awesome that's oh, great you know i think that like i think i don't think anybody here is upset at that car count i think that's pretty damn good all things considered um but there's there's something cool about you know like 1300 miles this year like that's you don't get that anywhere else even if it was six cars i'm still game let's do this yeah. right so like victor how do you feel about that i mean is there is there, is there you're from mexico so you tell me is 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 the mystique the same for you yeah it's always the same because uh, you get to race and travel to places we usually don't go like um just past loreto we really don't venture up here that much so it's all new. Um, I mean, not new, but it's just good to to be able to race there pre-run. And also, like, for instance, um, uh, that last section up there from Valle de Trinidad to the to the finish line that I'm, I'll be hopefully jumping in. Um, I mean, that that stuff, that's the second time I've, I've raced through that. So it's always nice to kind of, you know, bounce around these different areas in, in Baja, which is always always cool for us. You know, it's yeah. not, not the local races, but you get to use roads that, that we don't normally used sometimes or or they don't they don't they don't are not used by the organizations down here but yeah it's always always cool we we did the one in um back in 07 that was shy of 1300 miles i think it, it was, was like 12 1280 or 1290 right uh, something like that that was actually my first baja 1000 and um uh, this guy behind me was my co-pilot for that race and we did it we split it just between two drivers um i started it yeah. then we Another driver just helped me out with 300 miles so I can get off the car, pee, eat, and jump back in. And yeah, it was, we, we missed first place for a minute, nine seconds, ended up in second. But um, fairly Holy uneventful. Crap. The only thing we had was a, a flat tire and um, two one, just two flats, right? Two flats. Yeah, just two flats. And I think the other team um, had an issue. They got stuck 
uh, in, in that section in front of Bay LA. So that was it. Yeah, luckily it was. Yeah, I was I was destroyed by the time I got to the finish line, though. <laughs> in in what, cla- what class were you racing when you did that? That's 1600. That's massively impressive to do two drivers over over almost thirteen hundred miles. So, so yeah, Brian, no any better. <laughs> yeah, well, so, so, well, you know, well, ignorance, well, ignorance is bliss, right? Well, whoa, well, whoa! Well. I want to I want to get this clear. Victor wanted to do it with two drivers this race yeah. this whole time. That's so he kept calling. He kept calling me a wussy. He goes, "Let's go, you and me. Let's just take the whole thing." And I'm like, it's, "Victor, I can't do it, man. I'm the not doing strategy, it." Cotton. I don't know. He wanted to do this one, two drivers. I mean, look, it's possible. Yeah, it, yeah, is. it is. It is possible. I mean, like, no, Ramsey just... Elwar, El, Elwardani did the 2007 by himself in his single seater. The guy that is possible. He did Iron Man's on the puddles. But the friend of ours did it in the class nine, and he's, he Iron Man the whole thing. It was the, a run from Ensenada to uh, to La Paz and won it. And won it, right? Yeah, he won it in the class nine yeah. by himself. Yeah. That's so, crazy. Since we're on the topic, I mean, I don't, I don't know, Eric. I, I don't know about you, but I feel nice and safe having my co-writer with me that I can blame oh, everything yeah. on. And hey, get out and push, monkey. Um, that's <laughs> always nice. So, <laughs> Victor and Reese, you guys in the single seater. I used to race a single seater. I got anxiety racing in the States in that thing. Is, is, is it something, does it bother you guys? Is it in the back of your head? Does it, does it change the way you race? I, I, I don't think so. I started racing class nine in a, in a single seater. And then, uh, then I went to two seater 1600s and, um, and then yeah, jumped around classes and then ended up in a single seat class one car, which I also did uh, the whole score series in 2015 in that car in a single seat Jimco. And honestly, um, it, it, I, I think you are more focused, focused as a driver when you're driving single. Um, yes, there's that thing behind your mind that you're on your own and you have to do everything yourself if, if something goes wrong. But I think that plays a little bit more of, uh, you're also a little bit more cautious because you know that that can happen. And, and there's nobody else you can rely on just by yourself. So um, yeah. that and also, I think in the bigger classes where, where you're going faster, a co-driver is a huge advantage because of the GPS readings. I mean, you're mm-hmm. going, you know, a hundred miles an hour or more. You really need a co-driver. Like it, it's, it's, you're going to be way faster. Think, on a things come up, things come at you quick at a hundred miles. Yeah. Away, they do. On a 1600, I think on, on a long race like this, I think you're, you're still better off with, with a two seater. Always that, that co-driver's, it's, it's really big because especially on these long races, if you're doing long sections, um, e- even just having somebody beside you, just cheering you on or, or just somebody to talk to is huge. Um, I, I think that's, that's good. But other than that, I mean, there's, there's a couple loners like us that they are still used to that um, single seater <laughs> racing, which is it's still good of its own. You know, it's, but it, it, it kind of gives you that warrior mentality for sure. You know, Reese, how do you feel about it? So when we got into 1600, um, you know, one of the guys that's really close that, with me that's raced 1600 a lot is Sean Backus. And Sean told me, he's like, if you want to race 1600, you've got to be on the edge at all times. And you've just got to be wide open because he was doing all the mud races and all the, you know, all the local, local stuff. And after I, you know, kind of got a taste of 1600, I was thinking, I don't know if I want to risk someone's life in the right seat, the, how hard you have to drive these things. I mean, it is gnarly how hard you have to drive these things. And so it's different down in Baja because you're not, you know, you, you, especially like a race like this, you're not pushing it as hard. But like the more races, I don't know, we're wide open and these cars are still moving. You know, you're doing 70, 80 miles an hour. You're on the edge. And there's just something that I get comfort in knowing that I'm putting myself through this and I can push as hard as I want. I'm not putting somebody else through something that, you know, even they say they might enjoy it might be a little, little dangerous. So it's, uh, it's like signing for the rental car, right? Like sign yeah. here if you waive all liability, right? So, you know, it's kind of, you know, I, in, I do. Yeah. In Mexico though. And this thousand, you know, I'm looking at it as this is going to sound really weird, but almost like I'm, I think I'm going to learn something about myself. You know, <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm going to be spending those 400 miles, in my own head. And usually I find myself like either singing a song or going like often to the weirdest thoughts. Um, and that's really fun. And just being able to kind of just 
zone out. And the interesting part about that is I find myself actually turning faster lap times when I'm not even thinking about driving. Um, when I'm in autopilot, it's the car, you're kind of just, you're, you're really loose on the steering wheel. Everything's flowing really well. And you're just in this Zen. And I think you can only really get like that if there's not somebody in your ear constantly. And so it's, you know, there's, it's also nice to have a two seater and like, you know, have like a really nice section, a really nice corner and go, dude, that was awesome. And like fist pump the guy, you don't get that, but there's positives of the 16, you know, single seat that are fun. You know, you know, a hundred percent. And I, I've lived both worlds. I, I started in the sport as a co-writer. So for me, that that's really all it took for me to want a two seater was like, well, I have more fun when I'm with somebody, but there is that, that, like you said, that Zen you hit that, that perfect moment in the single seater where you're just enjoying yourself. And you look down at the mile marker and you're like, well, shit, I just did 40 miles. And like, I was thinking about, you know, nothing, you know, it's kind of weird how that works and how the brain kind of, disassociates and you just fall into that that jedi place of of yeah. doing what you exactly what you should do exactly. yeah. so when, you, when you're when you're really like trying to drive fast it's insane how much slower you go and yeah when you have somebody in your ear ear like barking like faster faster you know you a lot of times you're slowing down or you're gonna wreck so because you're pushing yourself you know uh before my first 1600 race behind the wheel I went to the off-road expo. This was 2014. Ran into Mr. Rob McCachron. Some of you might know him. Hmm. And I asked him, I said, I'm driving my first race next weekend. What advice do you have? And he's like, just go have fun. Just go have fun. He goes, when you're fun, you're smooth. When you're smooth, you're fast. And it's really that simple. And like, you know, of course, like being, you know, like you want to listen to that. But like, you know, as I'm sitting there at the starting line, just white knuckling, you know, it's kind of hard, but like, you know, the more miles you get in and it's like, yeah, like I'm just going to go out and have a good time. And, you know, when you do that, you end up turning really quick lap times. You know, when yeah. you start beating yourself up over missing a corner and you, oh man, I, hit, I missed my braking zone by, by 30, 40 feet. Like, oh man, hey, you start beating yourself up. You start talking bad about yourself. Then you're in your head for the next 30, 40 miles trying to recollect. If you're just like, oh man, this is great. I'm having such a good time. You don't even realize it. And then you end up like you like you said, Reese, you end up, you know, miles down the course, like clicking along and you're like, my pace is great right now. Yeah, that's I think, you know, the and and unfortunately sometimes that happens. Maybe when you're out of the race, something breaks and you don't have anything to lose. And that's un, that's unfortunate because a lot of times you're like, you're like, okay, I've got I got five minutes, I need to catch up on this guy. And that's the wrong, wrong mentality to have, right? And you know, I the one of the funnier things every time we race a stateside race is I, have, um, you know, I'm really thankful to have Eric Dean help on a lot of the stuff that we do. He's, you know, either one of in the main pit or remote pit with my dad. My dad, you know, is, is there doing everything for me. And, you know, Eric hates when I do this, but I'll be on the radio just like just chirping, just having so much fun, screaming, having a great time. And Eric's like, that's not what the radio is for. And I'm just like, I don't care. I'm having fun. And that's when I'm driving my fastest. So it's great. I, you know, I've, I've been accused by my crew chief of doing the same. He's like, dude, will you shut up? <laughs> Sorry, man. I'm lonely in here. So I got to have somebody to talk to me. <laughs> oh, man. So that's pretty good, guys. All right. So, Victor. Well, oh, go ahead. What is your best taco spot in La Paz? Ooh. Best taco spot in La Paz. What do you think, guys? Tacos La Paz or which ones? I think ta Tacos La Paz is that yeah, the name? Tacos, tacos, La, Paz, tacos yeah. La Paz is is probably the best one. Yeah, the, the fish right, tacos there. The, uh, you heard that's right yeah. on the Malcon. Huh? It, it's on the Malcon. Is that what I heard? Yeah. Right, right off the Malcon, right, Chubby? Uh, block up the street. Yeah. Right where the Malcon starts, one block up. Yeah, it's right there. I can't miss it. All right, All right. I want to report. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Eric. yeah. I'll, I'll come back with my with my tacos as I stuff my fat face up the peninsula. <laughs> <laughs> Reese, if you 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 being the uh, the San Felipe guy, what's your favorite spot in San Felipe? Oh, uh, you know that we have. Last time we went down to San Felipe, there was a stop halfway down on the highway, and I don't even know that it was like. 
it wasn't even a restaurant. You know, there was just a family that was cooking burritos and tacos, and I'll never forget that. And I think we're going to try to find that same spot on the way down. Dad, do you know what that, where we were? What was that place called? Down where the swamp is. Down there where it's the right, yeah, it's right, right across from the Thule's. The yeah, it was. Water. I mean, it was incredible. Uh, you know, once we get down into San Felipe, the last couple of years, unfortunately, a lot of stuff was shut down because of COVID. Um, and so I'm really excited to see some energy back in that in that town. Um, so it's it's going to be good. Good. Eric, being the most seasoned veteran here, can you give us a couple of your favorite spots on the way up the peninsula? As far as uh, tacos? <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever you got to, whatever, whatever recommendations the uh, Baja Chamber of Commerce has to offer. Hong Kong. First off. No, it's, <laughs> no, actually, I just, just enjoying new taco stands is, is our favorite adventure. You know, let's try this one. Let's try that one. So try to get out of the habit of going to the same place every time. Love that. Is there anyone to avoid where you've gotten sick? <laughs> I've never gotten sick down there. Oh, that's good. Never. Uh, I have, but it was my own fault. Yeah. Too much booze. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but Reese, you did touch on something, your game plan. How long have you guys been working on your game plan, <clears throat> your, your logistics on this one? I mean, even you too, Brian. I think I'm the only non-racer, racer, uh, not driving how long have you guys been working on your pit plan? So we're running really lean. And, um, you know, when Victor and I first started talking about this, the big thing is we just wanted to understand which mile sections I was getting in the car and when Victor was going to get in the car. I think Victor's number one goal, and I don't want to speak for you, Victor, but was to be able to do as many miles as possible. And so I just wanted to know my section. And I think we had probably established that two, three weeks ago. And then from there, we really were able to start planning. Um, Victor's got a lot of miles in the car. Victor, I think you're doing almost 700 miles, or I'd have to look. So, um, yeah, yeah I've, I think I've got it in front of me here. Um, he's got, let's see if I can use my keyboard here. One. Of course, my thing's not working. But... So, Eric, you said Andy's doing all your logistics. How long is – are you doing any of it at all, or is it just all him? It's all him. 100%. Okay. So how long has, have you been working on yeah. it? Uh, since the – before the Baja 400, so we started talking. Oh, man. How, so, I mean, um, I was going to uh, say, I mean, but you obviously we know that there's, there's certain places pretty much, of course, has to go through to get north. But, I mean, I don't even think the map was out before the 400, was it? Yeah, well, we're talking about, like, who's going to be starting and, you know, who yeah. else running on the team, uh, what we're doing to the car, you know, that kind of stuff. Oh, oh yeah, it's it starts way, way, way before the map comes out, you know. I mean, maybe we can... go ahead, Reese. I was going to say, maybe after this topic, we can jump into that, what Eric just brought up is essentially what, what you do to the car before a thousand, because, um, you know, Victor took on quite a bit here and I'm sure Eric did too. And, you know, it's a team effort, but. Yeah. So, you know, sounds, sounds like everybody's been working on it for the last month or two. Is that about right? Yeah. I mean, so for me, it was as, I mean, like I had a general idea because like I said, I know where the course is going to go for the most part in the real, the real, change for me was are we going north through san felipe are we going north up the pacific coast sure i can tell you i did not see the chapala catavina loop coming that was the curveball for me um i'll be i'll be honest with the rest of you guys this being only my third or fourth thousand that section scares the bejesus out of me there's no help there's nobody there the silt beds i heard about are, are pretty nasty reese i don't envy you at all Eric, if, if that's your section as well, I don't envy you at all. I'm going to enjoy my nice beach run um, up to Ignacio. And uh, I'm going to work on my tan a little bit. Well, actually, it'll probably be in the middle of the night. But um, that section does give me the heebie-jeebies a little bit because you are on your own, which we kind of talked about already, Reese. Um, yeah. But yeah, for us, the, the the planning started as soon as the map dropped. We already had an idea of, of who we wanted to start. And, you know, we had some guys who have done – 
the Chapala and Catavina loop before, so it's kind of an easy plug and play for them. Um, and then I I got I got roped into doing Loretto to Ignacio because that's what I did in 2017, just the other direction. So I um, mean, it is a beautiful beautiful drive for sure. Um, there are some gotchas in there. Is, yeah, is, that that loop is really gonna set um, whether I have a really great day or a really bad day. <laughs> so you know, I know. <laughs> I, it, it, uh, yeah, yeah, no, you hit the nail on the head, and I think it's the same for me as well because from 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 uh, mile three fifty to Ignacio, I'm on my own. Yep. Yeah. I have one. I have one BFG pit there, but we're not sending really any parts with them because we don't want to. You know, we send parts there, and then those parts They're are lost. sacrificed the rest mm -hmm. of the race. Yep. You know, so, you know, it was it was kind of an honor, I guess, to get the section of like, hey, here you go, dude. Don't screw it up because if you do, we're done. We can't we can't get to you. I think so, that's why Victor gave me the loop is honestly because he's got so many miles coming up. We need someone fresh in the car, and so 100%. Eric Dean and I are going to spend one full day just absolutely knowing every single you know, try to know every single boulder yeah. and, yeah. you know, gotcha going through there. Um, the good part is, is if everything goes well, we'll be jumping into that section at sunrise. Um, yeah. Going through that at night, it would be really challenging. Um, I don't think you can get there before the sun rises. You know, if we're looking at 41 miles an hour, um, you know, coming into that should be, uh, oh no, it's going to be right before the sun comes up. It should be uh, about 5 30 in the morning, yeah, 5 5 15 in the morning. Yeah. So, yeah, so, um, it's just going to be one of those sections that you're going to need to know, yeah, really well. Does any did, uh, I'll start, Victor, I'll start with you and then and then we'll go to Eric. Uh, is there any sections in particular that do have you concerned where you know, like, I need to be on my best behavior? I know these are their gotchas here, you know, what do I need to watch out for? Well, um, as of now, I mean, we I still haven't pre-run that section from um, Vizcaino to Belle of LA. But, um, like, uh, my concern right now is the um, – shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Starting behind me, so I have to say the start because I have the, the Bohemian bullet right behind our – he says he's going to pass me, like, the first uh, five minutes of the race. So. <laughs> We're not letting that happen. Let, all right? Hey, you know what, Victor? Just <laughs> let him. Just let him. Just let him. That's, that, that's my advice. Just let him go. <laughs> yeah. That for me, that right now, that last section, because uh, I pre-run that on my dirt bike last week, and those those last 120 miles are brutal. I mean, that's Valley T into the finish, guys. Yeah. Nasty, and it's going to get probably twice as worse by race day. So, I mean, and your I, time I, be probably night. Uh, it's there's fairly remote. There's an, the the other one section there that just before Ojos Negros is is pretty remote. So uh, and it's an area that I'm not 100. percent I'm, I'm not very familiar with. So that that's the section that I kind of have to know that take it really slow and and just just get the car in and out without an issue. And I know Hopefully. that that area in particular sees so much race traffic yep. from you know score uh, code record everything they just. Oh, yeah. they, bombard that area and it's just it's beat up eric yeah. what about you what, what are, do you have any spots where you're concerned definitely in the last um i mean it's really rough you know we just ball 400 was really rough at the end there so it just that area is just getting so beat up um uh you know, and it's it's not just the roughness. It's just like it, it, you, you get fatigued after bump, after bump, after rock, after rock, and up and down. And, you know, just, you know, that's where the fatigue is at and where your team is fatigued and the intentions are high and egos are at their last little yeah. bit of uh, thread left. You know, I think it's, it's you don't want to beat a dead horse, but this is as much a mental race as it is a physical one. Oh, absolutely. You know? Yeah, that's a, so the section that, you know, I'm not really worried about the first loop. I think we're really used to going through some rocky sections and going through some technical stuff, doing the more races. I'm really worried about, I think I saw in Race Desert, the there was a mile, it was either 1,000 or 1,100. It's a massive silt bed. I think that's where Cameron Steele got stuck and his guys are two-wheel drive trophy truck. Um, you're going to, and they're saying that you pretty much need four-wheel drive to get through there. And so- that, I hate to burst your bubble. That's actually between mile 900 and 925. 
Nine, okay, still in my section. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so I was looking at uh, I was looking at Race Desert, and if you know I'm going to be pretty far in my run at that that point, and uh, getting out of the car would just be it'd be a nightmare. It sucks. It sucks. Yeah. You know, I think the, the one you bought on veterans. Call me out if I'm wrong on this. The one good thing to starting farther back, the course is burned in. So at least you kind of have an idea of like a general, especially in San Felipe, where there's 50 lines in every other direction. But you have a general idea of like, this should work. If, if this tire tracks, you know, went this, I'm, you know, it should work, right? In theory, I see Eric laughing. Eric, in front of you, I, know, you know what? I, I always find myself, if I blow a corner and there's a tree down, I always say, hey, I'm not the only one that blew this corner. So that's usually the trails we end up following is everybody's mistakes everywhere. So I guess it's that. Yeah. So, yeah, Reese touched on it earlier. I think it's a great point. And so did Eric. What what, what are we doing special to, to, to prep these cars to make it 1,300 miles? I don't know about you guys, but we are going to do like a very – light prep on the car in Vizcaino at about halfway. We're going to, we're going to stop. We're going to change air filter. We're going to, you know, kind of check everything. We're going to retighten CVs. We're going to make sure we're in ship shape. You know, what about you guys? Do we have, do we have, you know, any special tricks we're pulling out for this one? Hold on. Let me get my notepad real quick first. <laughs> 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 Well, the, the only thing I can say, we did it in 07. We didn't even change the air filter on that car. Seriously. It was, it, we didn't probably even didn't know we had to change it. We didn't do any car. It we, Just besides changing. We didn't even swap tires, did we? Nope. Nothing. Same, same tires all the race. Yeah. I mean, look, it yeah. it, it kind of lends itself to, like, these cars will take a lot of abuse. You know, it's, yeah. it's we all kind of wig out. And, may, you know, like I said, maybe that's the... Uh, the, the paranoid person in me of like, hey, we need to stop in Vizcaino you know, and we need to once over the car just to be safe. But man, like if you do it right the first time, there's a good chance you're going to be okay as long as you're not driving like a hammerhead. Yeah, you so, know, we had we had a, a veteran prep the car. So Bruce Fraley went through the entire car. Um, and, uh, you know, Victor stepped up and said, you know, I want the best car at the start line that we could possibly have. And there's no question that that's the direction that he took. And so we're going in with a absolute weapon of a race vehicle to the start. And so, you know, having that confidence in the back of your mind, and then also knowing that you're not pushing the car to 100%, that car should make it the entire way. We're running those new uh, tensor regulators on the back. We saw how Cole Harden did on those at the Moore race. He finished 300 miles and the thing looked brand new. I mean, yeah. I was thoroughly impressed. The tire looked literally brand new. Um, Daniel Dean, who rode with him, said they had some really hard rock hits. And so he thought for sure they had multiple flats and the tire didn't even take a licking. So um, I, I think that tire is going to be the 1600 tire to run in the next 10 to 12 years. And I'm not saying it will happen by then. I'm saying... In the next decade, everyone's going to be on the tensor. Um, Unless you're having are... run a, and you run a BFG. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, that's a nice part about having BFG pits, running those BFG tires, being able to use them as a resource. That tire has a lot of bite on it. So if you have a 2D, you know, it'll it'll make it the whole way. So, so, so Eric, Re so. Reese is teeing you up here. I mean, I know obviously you're a diehard BFG guy. What are you doing to the car? I mean, obviously you're confident in the in the tires you have. What what do you what do you think? Yeah, definitely confident in the BFGs. We've had, you know, great luck. I think we've had one flat in the last couple of years. Um, you know, obviously the 2D was a step up. Uh again, I just, you know, uh I just turned to Foltz and uh say, what do you recommend? So, and that's what we've worked towards in the last year. Or so, so so yeah. Uh, and then, you know, all the new, you know, your drivetrain, your suspension, shocks, everything that's going to wear any, you know, any wear part, you got to start with new. Um, yeah. So it's, it's basically like a new car. 
Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's always fun uh, telling people who aren't off-road savvy. It's like, oh yeah, you know, we basically rebuild our cars between races. And I'm like, what, what? People don't get it. But I mean, I mean, if you want to win and you want to survive, you kind of have to, which is pretty wild. And it's, it's funny because it's like everybody here. Um, I know Mark, Mark Winston, who's in the driver of record and the owner of that car. He very similar to the rest of you guys. It's, we basically have a new car. There's not, yeah. there's not anything on this car that wasn't touched. Um, and that, and we, we got our prep done by, by Rulo over at Rulo's prep and fab. I'm sure a lot of you guys know Rulo. Um, Reese, like you said, you know, we're showing up with a weapon that we know is going to make it 1300 miles. You know, we did it in 17 in the, in the, in the five sixteen hundred. And we kind of were joking around the morning after the race, like, well, shit guys, I think we could drive this thing back up. No problem. <laughs> and I, and I, you know, we joke, but I kind of believe it, you know, I mean, if you don't beat the car up, it's, it's possible what the, you know, it's crazy what these things will do. Yeah. Yeah, that's a goal. Cool, keep the car together. And, yeah, it, you know, and I think one more thing about 1600 is you have to have a lot of seat time to know what the car can and can't take. And so the cars are built really well, but you can't just throw anybody in the car seat and just say, hammer down. You're not going to make it. You're going to, you're going to, you're going to grenade that trance. You know, you're just, you're going to break something or you're going to bash a rock through the front beam. Um, something's going to happen. And so having that seat time and knowing kind of what your ground clearance is, knowing how to keep the car together, I think that's going to be really important. And, and it Absolutely. sounds like you're, you're starting Victor, um, who's got a lot of experience. And so how long have you been racing 1600, Victor? Uh, since 2005. Okay. Yeah. So Five. almost, almost no, not years. But I raced. 2005, six, seven, and eight, and 1600. So about three, three and a half years. Okay. So maybe we can, we can. That's a kind of a good topic. So you know, Victor, your your pre runner behind you is pretty much a class one car. You've had a class one car. Um, you know, you just went back to 1600. Um, you know, why'd you go back to 16, and what what drew you back? Economics, my friend. Economics. <laughs> oh, I don't. I don't know. I don't know. That's getting ready. What's for funny is, yeah, <laughs> Reese is going the other direction because it, it's funny yeah. how that works. That's economics, but the other side of it, right? <laughs> no, yeah. Honestly, it was a combination of. Um, I, I usually do all my prep myself, so I'm um, just prepping the the class one and the sixteen. It's it's a different animal. I mean, um, carrying those big shocks on your own, the tires. Uh, just going through the car, I mean, on a 16 car, you can take that motor out in 10, 15 minutes, 20 tops, and you can basically do it by yourself. You can never do that in class one. So um, just a, lo a lot of the of the logistics of just getting the car ready, uh, moving it around. And, and also, I mean, just the gas is more expensive. You're changing tires every race. Um, I, I was under the impression that racing class one here in Mexico – um, that the car would be, it would probably be less prep because you're not, I mean, everything's bigger, beefier, but then again, you're going faster, you're, you're beating, you're beating it up more. So it's, it's basically the same thing. You're changing CDs after every couple of races, you're going through the trainees, the same, and just everything is just exponentially more expensive on, on those cars. And honestly, um, the competition in the 16 cars, I think that's, that would uh, probably draws everybody to back to that class. It's, it's, it, I, I can't say enough. Everybody, it, the quality of the drivers there is is amazing. Um, it's just it's a different vibe than racing the big cars. Like just the the ambience of the guys, the camaraderie is totally different. On the, on the bigger cars, I think there's more. Uh, it's more of a consequence. The consequences are way higher. So um, than than racing a 16 car. So that that mentality by itself is just it, it makes racing. A little bit more relaxing in the sense that you're not risking your life as much as, as one of those cars so and you, you tend to push yourself a little more and it's, it's just very different i mean just going 100 miles an hour and flipping that thing um is going to be way more consequential than going 75 so well, I, I think that's one of the we're doing 75 this race victor <laughs> <laughs> He's he's gonna put a he's gonna put a, a a tracker and a tattler on you. He's gonna he's gonna ping you on the sat phone if you're if you're going too fast. <laughs> no, I I'm excited to see uh, you know how the cars do down there and uh, the sections. It's just it's so different than the stuff that we get in the more race. Um, I'm just you know racing the 1600 car down there is gonna be really fun. 
it, yeah, it, so just, me, just to touch on, on what you said, Brian, about um, I remember it was, it was uh, Reese or Brian that saying that you kind of have to know what what the car can do and how much you can push it. Um, honestly, um, I didn't learn that till I raced with you guys up there at the Moore race. I mean, I, I did not. I had no idea the 16 cars could take that abuse. I mean, those 300 miles just pounding the car like you guys pound it. Uh, it's, it just opened my blew my mind. I, I didn't think those cars could take that kind of abuse. Yeah. You know, it's it's funny you mention that. Is I, I helped a friend out at the last Moore race, and he has only ever driven a single seat sixteen hundred car by himself, never ridden with anybody. So I took him in my two seater, and he's like, "I want to see what these things can do." And I'm kind of like, <laughs> "I'll show you. I'll show you some stuff. You want to see some stuff?" And yeah. it, it's it's it really is. And I mean, like I had that experience. Reese, I'm sure you did. Eric, I'm sure you did at one point. Is we all had that experience of like, holy crap. This little 85 horsepower Volkswagen freaking gets it. Yep. If you know what you're doing, these cars boogie. Yeah. You know? And you guys are like that. Do you had those cars? Like I didn't believe Reese that is like if you're you're not gonna you don't win unless you have to race it like with your foot on the gas on the floorboard the whole time. And I did not I, believe it. And I, those cars are there. I mean, it's just the the fun factor. Um, it's just like racing a dirt bike with a cage around you. I mean, you're jumping, yeah. you're skipping a couple whoops then you're down again then you're sideways and you jump your front wheels are in the air and then your back wheels are in the air i mean it's they're super fun and, and you guys like really haul ass up there it's there's an eye opener you, you, how quick you guys are up in that rough sections so we went my first time racing a 1600 car uh, well i should back up a little bit the 1600 car came for sale that that we're racing in this thousand and it had the, the pedigree behind it it was also an aluminum craft and if anybody kind of knows me, I essentially will only own an Alumacraft. I've, I've had, I think I was counting the other day, I think I've had 10 of them. And so it was like, I'm like, dad, this is our opportunity. And, you know, I pitched it to him as, hey, we're going to rebuild the motor ourselves. We're going to rebuild the trans ourselves. We're going to do everything ourselves. It's super simple, you know, and and he took the bait. And so we went down and we picked up the car. Um, Jordan he, fell, he fell for it, right, Reese? Yeah, Jake Jake Velasco sold it to us, and it was just a, it was a beautiful car. And I probably had five miles in it, and we went out to a, a bar stow, and we just entered. And Jake told me he goes, just you know, just go see what you can do and have fun. And uh, my buddy Sean that I was telling you guys about, who's won a thousand multiple times and, and trophy, and really a renowned racer, um, he's like Reese. I'm serious. Like I want you to go to that race, and I want you to never pick your foot off the gas pedal. He goes, the only time you pick your foot off the gas pedal is when you have to hit the brakes. And I showed up to Barstow, and it's a stack field. Bryce Farrar is out there. And by, the, I think, the second lap, I had it like five minutes on everybody. And my dad's like, you got to slow it down, dude. <laughs> you got to slow it down. We ended up having a problem, but I've never run that fast. And it, I think it's because I had that mentality of, if you lift, you lose. And I just had, I had Sean's like voice in my ear the whole time. And I'm like looking at my, I look down and I'm like, I do not pick that foot up. Do not pick that foot up. It was, it was pretty wild. It, it, it goes against every instinct you have is to like, you're like this, we should, this, it shouldn't do this. The car shouldn't yeah. do this. And then yeah, you get yeah. away with it. And then it, it's, it's, it's very addicting in that way of like, wait, if we got away with that, what what else can I get away with? What where else can I push the envelope, and what else can I do? And like Victor was talking about consequences earlier. I mean, I'm sure you guys know, you know, all of you know, we had a pretty big consequences come in September of 2020. But you know, that is what is required to win these races these days. Tim yeah. Craig told me that at the last one. He goes, "It's a little ridiculous what we have to do to win a race in, in the states these days." And, I gotta be honest. I'm looking forward to the pace of the thousand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you're going. Looking you're going to this marathon. I don't want to. I don't want to be in a sprint every race. I I want to. I want to outlast some of you guys. Yeah, you're going from a full wide open race to a, a pr preservation, preservation, yep. preservation. Just, just survive, man. Just yep. survive. I think everybody here. We keep telling ourselves that so we can drill it into our our thick skulls of like we just need to survive. Yeah, that's I'm excited about having Eric Dean and the pre-runner with me for a few days because we're gonna have a conversation about that when we see every section. You know, hey, you know, do you think we can push through here? And it's it's all gonna come down to when when Victor hands the car over to me at seven sixty seven wherever you know just outside of Bay of LA. I think we're gonna know whether we are cruising and getting that car to finish line, whether we have to make time. 
you know, and I'm excited for kind of pick Eric's brain about that. Hey, you know, what do you think about this section? Um, Cause you got to take risks in certain areas if, if it comes down to it, but still got to keep the car alive. Yep. Starting behind the, the stock UTVs is a challenge. It's been a challenge this score season because there's, you know, four or five of them that are pretty slow, but they, they run a different pace. They're kind of faster in the straight and slower in the rough. So it kind of packs up the class a little bit. So right off the start, you got to be getting around those dust makers. Eric, Eric, how aggressive do you have to pass these guys? And that's an honest question from somebody who doesn't race with a lot of score UTVs. I uh, mean, do, are, are we full on, you know, bumper warfare here or, or are they pretty uh, respectful of the, the push to pass? What's the them. deal? Um, what? We can't, wait, hold on. We can't hit them? No, you no, can't hit them. So, yeah, we, I mean, we race clean with everyone in our class. There's no reason to bash each other up on these long races. Uh, but the UTVs don't move until you uh, let them know you're back there. I don't know what it is. The push to pass doesn't seem to work with them. So polish your chrome horn. Yeah, there, there's something to be said for having, I think, you know, everybody here being as tenured as you are, there's, there's a racing etiquette. You know, when you've been caught, you know, you know, okay, it's time to move. It's time to be a gentleman. And, and hopefully karma will come back around for me later in the day, you know? Um, but yeah, it is, it is an ongoing point of concern in our team of, you know, how many of these UTVs are we going to have to politely ask to move, you know? Yeah. yeah it's a challenge, but, um, you know, we all got to get through them and, and, uh, you know, it's just part of it. At least you're not five unlimited. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. Five Unlimited got shafted even harder than we did. I think that was a mistake. They should be they should be up with the 12 cars. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's there, you know, Robbie Hendrickson, you know, the king of all data against the UTV fight. Because he will do, he will go to his grave thinking that the Volkswagen's faster than the UTV and in a lot of places we are and like Eric was saying, in the straightaways and maybe the sand washes, they probably get away from us. But he's like, we beat them last year. We beat them last year. We should start in front. And I'm like, look, I don't fault your logic. But, I mean, like, under a class average, did we all finish quicker than they did? Did they all finish, fit, fit, you know, quick finish quicker than we did? You know, kind of what's the deal? I don't know about you guys. I'm in favor of, like, almost like how Dakar does things. Of Like, based on your pedigree, you start a little further up the thing. You know, you mix classes a little bit. Let the fast guys run at the fast guys. Let the slower guys run at the slower guys. I know that's a pipe dream. What do you guys think about that? Mm, it's almost like UTVs need their own series. It's kind of a different culture. And I, I'm not like anti-UTV or anything, but um, it's kind of like motocross and desert racing. They're just different. So uh, That's fair. That's a fair point. It's, it's, it's a different culture. They come up differently. I mean, the first time I ever raced um, – in a desert car, bought a 516, and I, uh, uh, they wouldn't let me race it. <laughs> I had to ride with them and then buy it the next year. So, uh, you know, and then obviously I navigated before that and volunteered at, you know, uh, you know, course worker, you know, as a, as a, a real youngster. Um, so, you know, and I don't know if that's going away as time goes on. And, you know, I'm sure they have their own, uh, the way they do it in UTV, but it seems like it's more kind of from the, I don't know. It's just, it's just different. You know, they're just different. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I mean, it's, it, it is different. It's a different way of life, it's a different way of racing than what we're used to. You know, I, I do have a lot of respect for a lot of the UTV guys. It's just, please, when we catch you move over, because we worked hard to catch you. And you know, what's crazy is the fast ones are getting a lot faster and oh, yeah. wash all the, the, UTVs get faster, and that, and that's probably not even the, the the group of guys that I'm talking about. Is the guys that are finishing with the the top twenty overall with the ten cars and that's right, that's right. Those guys aren't the guys. It's it's the guys you know the weekend warriors who are out there having a great time and God love them. But you know, you got it. You got to you know you got to help us out a little bit when we catch you, because like I said, Eric called them dust makers, and they do kick up a lot of dust with all wheel drive. You know, so when we catch you, please remember that it's a long race. We're not racing against you. Do us a favor and let us over. 
<laughs> well, um, I think this is a good place to stop, guys. Uh, thank you guys so much for coming on. Uh, it's been great, you know, been a little baby ear, everybody's ear, and uh, picking up a little bit of dust, you know, bench racing and stuff. Real yeah. quick, let's um, I want to give each of you a chance to thank your team and your sponsors pre race. Um, we'll go Victor, Reese, and Eric. We'll, you know, like I said, thank who you got to thank. And as always, Eric and I here at Pro 1600, we thank you for your time. We know it's not easy, especially coming up with the race. So thanks for jumping on with us. Victor, go ahead. Yeah, well, well, thank you. Thank you guys for inviting me. It's been an, an honor, uh, being on, on, on this uh blog with you guys. And uh, so I just want to you know, thank Reese and his dad also that they've been carrying a lot of the weight up there um, with the car and and um, and taking it there to Bruce. So obviously, Bruce Fraley, which i pretty sure did an awesome job with the car, just like last time, put a lot of hours, a lot of effort to it. And, uh, and just all the guys down here that have been helping us with the pre-run, um, just driving us around and, and, you know, just on the car, um, teammates, just in general, you know, everybody that makes this happen. Um, also the organizers that, you know, that, that make this possible for us to, to even have these races, which I think it's, it's really cool. Cause I, I bet they have to go through a, a lot of red tape and a lot of things to make these events happen, which in itself is a huge challenge. And, uh, and that's that great that we can still, after all these years, keep running the Baja, but Ho hopefully that'll still be. Absolutely. Reese, go ahead, buddy. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate you guys putting this together. So pro 1600 still seeing it alive is, is fun. Um, want to thank my dad. Um, you know, my dad has, has been busting his ass, um, trying to get us ready for this race, um, leaning in a lot. Um, he has a lot of passion about this and, and, and it's made it really fun to be able to do this with him. Um, also want to thank Victor. I would be on the sidelines, um, watching this race if it wasn't for him. Um, he's brought me in, um, and has really, kind of treated me like a family and just said, hey, let's do this together. Um, completely listened to the suggestions I had, both in prepping the car and um, getting getting to where we are now. I'm really excited to do this race with him, and I'm, I'm honored to, uh, to be able to fill that seat. Um, also want to thank the deans, Eric and Daniel Dean. Um, Eric's going to be spending a lot of time with me down in Mexico and taking time away from, you know, his family and work. Um, and then, uh, Daniel put some time in, um, helping us out with the car and, um, you know, he's always been a good resource as we're, as we're trying to find that extra mile an hour. The Hardens have been great too. Um, they've let us use their shop a little bit for stuff and they've just always been a great resource. As far as companies, um, uh, Method Wheels and Tensor Tires have helped us out. And, um, oh, I, I, and I don't want to forget my pit crew that's coming down. So they're all taking time away from their families and their work. So we have uh, Casey Bushong, uh, one of my really close friends that's coming down and going to help with the pits. And then uh, we have Perry Penske with Pensign um, out of Yuma, Arizona. Um, Perry's coming down to help me out. Um, and then, um, yeah, so I'm really, really looking forward to it. Um, and we're going to have fun. Oh, and then we have uh, 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 Eric. We have Steve coming down. I'm sorry, I'm blanking on Steve's last name right now. Noble. Steve Goble. So, Steve Goble's coming down to help us. So I'm um, just really thankful. It's it's a it truly is a team effort. If it wasn't for everybody, you know, I'd be sitting at home watching watching this on TV, wishing I was there, saying, you know, one day, one day. But we're actually doing it, so it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Eric, go ahead, bud. So uh, obviously Andy and, and everybody else on the team, um, I can't name them all, uh, but I do want to ask, are we going to have a pro 1600 series, two races down South, two races North of the border, one snore, one more, one record, one code. Is it going to happen? We'll, you're, you're, we'll you're, you're, putting, you're putting us on the spot here, but these are very, very fair questions. And um, let's just say that Eric and I have been talking about what that might look like and what a series sponsor might look like. And I would love to make this happen. Yeah, you guys absolutely. caught my bit on the Fishgistic State of Off-Road. This was exactly the idea we had in mind already was trying to like, let's take four different, very different races and like maybe we can revive the Pro 1600 that was back in the early 2000s. Yeah. So, yeah. Or bring us back to Plaster City. Yeah, that's 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 an idea you, as well. You, Reese, you don't you don't want none of the smoke going up Gypsum Road, all right? Oh, 
No, there's only one way to see you, buddy. <laughs> I, I will give a plug here real quick. Uh, we talked about a little bit of tacos. If anybody is in Cabo San Lucas, Victor owns an amazing restaurant, El Huerto, just outside. It is phenomenal. Probably one of the best dining experiences I've ever had. If you guys are in Cabo San Lucas, go check his restaurant out, El Huerto. El, El Huerto. It's amazing. Thanks, Eric. It is yeah, that's a, that's a date night spot, guys. Don't don't yeah. go there with the beers and the you know in your in your shorts. Go there and take the wife. So it's beautiful. Excellent. Well, guys, thanks for jumping on. Real quick, as far as as I go, I'm Reese. You 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 touched on it quite a bit. This is a dream for a lot of us. I mean, I remember watching Dust to Glory in the theater. I think I was 11 years old, and um, you know, getting to do this again is uh, it's magical every time. So for me, I want to thank Mark Winston, uh, Guy Saavedra, Raul Solano, uh, Ruben Garcia, Sr. and Jr., um, Big Chris, Big Callahan, our two big, our main pit guys, and of course, you know, my dad, the old, uh, the old war horse that he is, decided to fly down with me last minute. So super pumped to have him back down. And then I'm sure I can speak for everybody when I want to say thanks to, the, to our wives and, and families and moms and dads who tolerate us uh, letting this consume our lives, um, you know, in the last holiday busy part of the year. So thanks to families, thanks to wives, girlfriends, moms, dads, everything. So Eric, any, any final fart parting thoughts from pro 1600? No, uh, I just want everybody to go out, have a great safe race and, uh, we'll be looking for some tacos and beers at the finish line, man. I hope everybody makes it there. Yeah. So. I'd love to, I'd love to, shake hands with everybody in person so if you see me in la paz or somewhere please say hello i'd love i'd love to see everybody and, yeah, and anybody back if i'm too exhausted to walk all right <laughs> and, 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 and anybody you. watching this podcast uh you know come up say hi to us if you see us in the pits if you see us at the finish line start line come come say hi and uh also don't forget to hit that like button subscribe share this video with all your friends let's get the word out yeah good luck brian good good luck eric yeah, yeah, good luck, you guys. guys. You as well. Thank you. Good luck, everybody. Make and bake, guys. All right, guys. All right. Have a great night.